Hello and welcome to the second introductory video about challenge-based learning. In this video, you will learn more about the organization of the learning process in challenge-based learning. One more thing before we dive into the subject matter. Information about the defining characteristics, the origin and precursors of challenge-based learning can be found in my first video. For an in-depth discussion of how the learning process in CBL can be structured, watch Noemi Dominguez's videos. How can students be guided through a challenge-based learning process? Let us use the three broad phases from the framework outlined in the CBL guide, namely engage, investigate and act. The learning process begins by engaging students. To create a learning environment, which is stimulating and engaging, the stage needs to be set for fruitful collaboration between students and any other stakeholders. This involves team formation, fostering team building, choosing a challenge and narrowing the challenge down. Let's start with team formation. If you have students from different disciplines in your class, it makes sense to form interdisciplinary teams. This way, each team can draw on a range of disciplinary knowledge and each student has an expert status for their field. Also, students will experience interdisciplinary collaboration and can develop transdisciplinary competence in this setting. The team size depends on the intended learning outcomes, the resources available to support teams and the scope and complexity of the challenge. Team sizes can vary between 3 to 10 students. To support larger teams, it is best to have one teacher or tutor responsible for one team only. Once teams have been formed, it is important to dedicate time and activities to foster team building and to support team building throughout the learning experience. Next, each team focuses on choosing a challenge within the so-called big idea. The big idea is the broad theme or topic of the class, for example, artificial intelligence. One option is to have student teams brainstorm possible challenges, then clustering the brainstormed ideas before voting for their top choices. This process allows students to choose and to take ownership of their challenge. If the challenges are provided by stakeholders from outside the university, it is still possible to provide a limited degree of choice in choosing a challenge. For example, student teams vote for their top three choices. Another option with ready-made challenges is to use them as a means for team formation. Students interested in the same challenge form a team to allow for interest-based work. Regardless of the degree of choice students have in choosing a challenge, students need to narrow the challenge down before starting to work on it. Let's consider the following example from the area of artificial intelligence, abbreviated AI. An example challenge could be, how can the widespread common misconceptions about AI be overcome? While this is definitely a challenge, it is too broad to act on. To illustrate this, let's consider the following questions. Which common misconceptions about AI exist? Which groups of people are prone to developing what kind of misconceptions? Where do these common misconceptions come from? How are these common misconceptions formed and spread? These questions show the multifaceted character of this challenge. Asking questions and answering them is a good way to narrow a challenge down to a workable level. To stick with the example, after undergoing a process of questioning and first attempts at answering these questions, a team might decide to work on the challenge of dispelling five common misconceptions about AI school graduates typically have. Once the challenge has been specified, students are ready to enter the second phase in the learning process, investigation. To begin with, students brainstorm and document the resources they have available as a team. 
This includes knowledge, for example, content knowledge within a certain discipline or knowing where to find new resources, but also skills, for example, how to search for relevant literature in a database, how to design a poster or create a video, etc. This documentation then serves as the foundation of the next step, brainstorming what the team needs to know in order to face their challenge. Depending on the complexity and scope of the challenge, this is likely to be a combination of knowledge acquired through reading academic articles and conducting research as a group. At this point, students should have become even clearer about the challenge and have outlined a plan for working on meeting the challenge. The teams autonomously conduct research on their challenge and explore the resources identified in the previous stage. The teacher's role is to check in with each team regularly to ensure there's progress, to assist should the research be leading them up a blind alley, or in case a team comes into conflict with each other. Stakeholders support the teams as a resource or even as partners in facing the challenge. The phase of investigation is followed by the final phase, which is action. The teams first synthesize their findings and document possible ways of solving the challenge. What the actual action looks like depends on the intended learning outcomes and the scope, complexity and nature of the challenge. If possible, a solution is prepared and put into practice. When it is not possible to implement the solution, a paper describing the solution and its implementation process is one possibility to synthesize what has been learned. The outcome of the challenge can also be an artifact, such as an outreach campaign, a blog post, wiki or public presentation. This way, the solution or outcome is also communicated to an audience beyond the classroom borders, which can be a motivator and shows appreciation for the work students have done. 